Step 15, determine if new employees are needed and then recruit. So you're gonna train and coach the existing people. And then you're gonna fill the talent gaps by finding new people. So generally the skill sets in a growing organizations aren't really gonna be available 100% of the time by the existing pool employees, no matter how much you like them and how much you train them. So a recruiting process for adding new employees with new skills into an organization is essential for growth. And as you hire and recruit, you've got to make sure that the new hires fit into your culture and they fit into the plan of where you're going in two to three years. You know, there are many pre-employment tests and assessments that can help you do this. I know we use two in this area that really lock in. Does this person fit? what I'm looking for from a behavior standpoint, but also a role standpoint. You know, culture is important. And I'll give you a personal story. I knew we were heading somewhere in three years. I hired somebody from the outside and they were really good at what they did. Matter of fact, they were known in the industry for what they did. They had no current role in our company here, but I hired them because I knew I needed them to go to the next level. They had the right skills, they had the right experience, and they had the right results. Here's where I fell down. I minimized the importance of culture. They came from a very large company where they got to walk around the hallway and they got to brainstorm. And they really weren't accountable for doing day-to-day -day activities. They were accountable for thinking and collaborating and doing all those things that they do. When they came into our organization, I needed them to take very specific action steps and be accountable to timeframes. And not just tell other people what to do, but to be a doer themselves in certain areas. That person lasted a month. Shame on me. Again, they had the right skills, right experiences, but they didn't fit into the organization. And because that, they left. And it was a great lesson for me because I knew better. I knew better. So when you're recruiting, you've got to make sure that that job description is current and it's clear and you've taken the whole search model into consideration. So let's talk about a process for recruiting, interviewing, and hiring. My first question to you is, what is your current process for recruiting and hiring? I mean, do you have a rock solid process? Do we even have one? Does it need to be updated? So the Sandler process is a methodology, a step-by-step. -step. And the first step in our hiring process is recruiting. So within this macro step, you need to make sure that you have a solid job description, you've got a hiring template, you've got a search model, and that you have an a area to go find your candidates. And once you've been recruiting, and you've got the, the candidates, whether they're internal or external, then you're going to start interviewing. Now, I'll stop for a second because most companies start with interviewing. They don't do the recruiting stick. They don't say this is the job that we're, we're hiring to. These are the characteristics in order to do a good job at that job. And then these are the candidate characteristics that would succeed at that job. We tend to just say, we're opening a job, let's start interviewing. That's a huge mistake. I mean, think about, for instance, in financial institutions. You could hire an account manager that hit 900% of quota at a different organization. But if your job profile said that you needed to call on executives, um, relationship management, but also hunt, right, as one of the things that that job needed, when they were searching for their candidate, they actually hired somebody that never hunted, only farmed. And so even though they blew away their quota, when they had to go get net new business in this, nu this new company, they fell short and they were shocked, but they shouldn't have been shocked. The mistake that they made is they jumped right into interviewing. And they didn't say, what are the characteristics that are gonna be needed in order to succeed at this job? And that was the key. When it comes to interviewing, you're gonna to have to make sure that you're prepared for the interview. And then also at the end of the interview, you make sure that you've debriefed with all the internal teams. 
oftentimes everyone's back to their day job and they forget to debrief. But you should do it as quickly as possible because people tend to forget. And people tend to forget the important things and they, then they remember what their gut said to them. But we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we ask good questions. And those questions should be really designed to uncover the search model, uncover the skills, uncover what experiences they have, and what's their mindset, what's their attitude, what's the results, what habits do they have. Most people just make up the interviewing questions. It's a serious mistake. Your interview questions should do nothing more than laser guide in order to make sure that you've got the answers in that search model. You also have to make sure that you don't have happy ears. Listen, we all have happy ears. When we have a job opening and it's for a current role, we know that somebody else has to fill in for their job and that job too. And sometimes it's you. And so we have happy ears or we lead them. You're going to have to be a good collaborator in this job. Is that something that you do well? Oh, sure, absolutely. Instead of saying, tell me a little bit about how you operate now. Do you work with others? Are you on your own? How does that look? And then they don't know why you're asking. So there's a way to do a good interview, which you should ask your Sandler trainer. Because the bad hire costs you money. It costs five, six times the salary. And think about all your time and energy for you and the rest of the company to spend on a new hire. And if it doesn't work out, that's a, that's a big problem. So let's go back and talk about the interview itself. Well, you need to control the environment. You got to make sure that you spend an appropriate amount of time and you're not rushed. There's no interruptions. There's no distractions, right? You've spent the time ahead of time looking at their resume, formulating your questions about the resume, but also about the search model, making sure that you've got those questions locked. You know what you're going to do. You've set a good upfront contract as far as the time of the interview. You're asking the applicant what they want to get out of the interview. You're telling them some of the key points that you're going to ask. You've talked about next steps. You want to make sure that you're not overselling the job. How many times have we told applicants how wonderful this place is to work and they really should be doing it? When in reality, your job as an interviewer is to disqualify people who should not be in your company. Not shove every breathing person into the company because they're sitting in front of you. Disqualify. You know, on your sales side of your company, their job is to disqualify as well. Not shove every opportunity into the funnel. When it comes over here, we've got to make sure that we do the same amount of things. We've got to make sure that we disqualify applicants that should not be here. And that's important. So as we go through, create your good upfront contract where you've got your purpose, your time, your agenda, and the outcome. Make sure that you have your questions. Make sure that you ask and give proper amounts of times to your applicant. And that alone will help you structure an interview. When you do a team interview, make sure that you've given the appropriate questions for different members of the team. It's, an, it's impossible for you to ask all of the questions that would uncover whether they have the right search model. So in our company, we do a phone interview and then we have three people interview a candidate. Each one of us has a couple of the same questions because we want to hone in on the answers, but we also have different questions. And those different questions are on purpose. They're to uncover, those are the skill questions. These are the experience questions. And that's why it's important for us to have a pre-meeting so we all know who's asking what. We also want to talk about the applicant, make sure we're all on the same page about the role. And then we want to get together immediately after and talk about what we learned. And that's a very objective versus subjective, which is here's what drives me insane. When a group of people after an interview get together and they say, so what do you think? Did you like them? I'm not saying that's not important, but that should not be your decision criteria. Did you like them? I've hired a lot of people that I liked early in my career. None of them are still with me. I've hired a lot of people that I probably wouldn't spend five minutes with in a social situation, but they rocked in their job. 
they fit that search model. So the world does not revolve around whether you like them. It should revolve around do they fit the role necessary in order for you to get your plan so your corporate vision is met. So go back and ask yourself, do you have a process for hiring? Do you have a process for interviewing? And do you have a process for onboarding? Let's talk about two minutes for onboarding. The biggest mistake that we make as leaders is that you hire a good person, then you say, good luck to you. I think in the hiring and onboarding process, the work starts when the employee comes to work, not up front when they get there. You've got to give them a roadmap to succeed as quickly as possible. I'm going to give you some four steps that'll help you do this in a short amount of time. Number one, you should create a list of all the things that that employee should be able to do in order to become 100% effective in that job. What is it? It's probably 40 to 60 things. So what are all the things that that employee should be able to do in order to become 100% successful? You could do this with your team. Doesn't have to just be you. Step two, you should say, when should they know those things? So let's go back to the example. If they should know 40 things, chances are they don't need to know all 40 things in the first week. There is a sequence of events. You may not have to know certain things until nine months, a year into your job. And you should be able to put that in sequential order. Now, if I step back for a second, what are you telling the employee at this point? You're giving them valuable information. We've determined as a company, in order to succeed at this job, you should know these set, the set of topics, whatever it is. And this is when you should know it. That helps this employee. But think about all the other people that work for you that want this job. If this is published, don't you think your, your best employees are working on all the things that it takes to become successful in this job when they're at another job? Because they know what it is. It's objective. It's not gut. So then they say, well, listen, I'm, I want that job. In order to get that job, I better start preparing. What would I prepare for? Most people don't know. But if you have these are the things necessary to succeed. Now you're actually building a bench and you're, you're really creating clarity for the people who work for you. So what, what are the items? What's the timing? Number three, give them an example. Give them an example. So let's say that you're hiring a manager. And one of the things that they have to do is have a great performance review. Well, you should show them what one looks like. You shouldn't say, do a great performance review, because they don't really know how to do that. You should give them, here are the steps that we follow for performance reviews. Preferably, you could even role play one or tape one so they can hear it. That's important. I know at Sandler, we've got audio, maybe 600 two to 10 minute audio clips of things that people are doing properly so they can hear it and they can mimic it. Step four, test it out. So let's say that they should do a performance review in the second month as an example. And here's an example of what one looks like that we feel is great. And then you say to your manager, at that time, let me see you do one. I'm the employee, do a performance review for me. And what you force them to do is actually do something that you said was necessary for success. This is great. Why? You establish a culture of accountability. They know what it takes, they have an example, and they're going to get tested. Second thing that it does is it increases the confidence and conviction of your employee. Why? They know what it takes to succeed, and now they've been practicing knowing that you are going to ask them. And when they're practicing, they get better and better and better and better. And when they go in front of you, maybe it's great. Maybe it's not, but I will promise you they'll spend a lot of time before you test out. If it's not great, it's your opportunity to coach and train. If it is great, tell them they're doing it well and then go on to the next one. This process will shrink the amount of time from hire to productivity. Good luck. The Road to Excellence, Six Leadership Strategies to Build a Bulletproof Business is on sale now at shop.sandler.com. Contact a local Sandler trainer to learn more about our Organizational Excellence Management Training Program or click subscribe to get notified about future management tips.